fascism. The very word is upsetting to the vast majority of people. Here in the geographical location known as the United States, we have all been taught about the great evils of fascism. The word makes people shudder as images of concentration camps and firing squads flash through their minds. Ask any American and they will tell you Hitler was evil and his brand of government, fascism, is evil. But what if I were to tell you that we are currently living under the rule of a fascist system right now? What if I were to tell you that our current statist overlords have changed the face of fascism and forced it upon us? You see, fascism is simply the merger of state and corporate power. It is a political system with a centrally planned economy and a state that is recognized as the only legitimate sovereignty. This, my friends, is precisely the system we find ourselves presently chained to. For more about what fascism really is, I recommend you to start with the work of Lou Rockwell, Fascism versus Capitalism. But for today's show, I would like to focus on one of the many ways we can separate ourselves from the current fascist state. It seems that us voluntarists often focus most of our efforts on the problem of the state, as in the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the United States government. But there is another side of this fascist state that we should be wary of. It is the industrial side of the military-industrial complex. It is the giant pharmaceutical and agricultural companies that control the food and medical markets, utilizing state power. It is a business entity, or any business entity, with ties to the state and a vested business interest in the continuance and growth of fascist state power. My name is Caleb Bader. And this is Journey of the Unshackled Mind. Here today to discuss fascism and medicine with us is the Neo Quayar, host of Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. I definitely love this guy's show. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's called Peaceful Anarchism. He has a blog by the same name. He's a great writer. Um, And he's just a very interesting guy. He worked as an acupuncturist for nine years. I went to college to study Eastern medicine. Um, and well, let's, let's just talk to you. Hi, Daniel. Hello. Thank you for the introduction. Yep. I, um, I studied Chinese medicine, um, for five and a half years. Uh, first I studied massage therapy and then I studied, um, <clears throat> acupuncture, Chinese herbs and Eastern nutrition. And, um, and most acupuncturists, by the way, um, um, don't necessarily have a massage background, but you can imagine if somebody is needling you, it would be nice that they have the sensitivity, right? And palpatory skills that a massage therapist has, <laughs> because I, you, you don't understand how many people have come to me, uh, and they say, I hate needles. Then I say, why? And the most common response is, I went to Chinatown, and this Chinese lady, <laughs> she needled me, and it was so painful. And I told her it was painful, and she's like, this is how it's supposed to feel. <laughs> you know, traumatizing people. So, and of course, you know, when you say the word needle, people think of injection needles or vaccinations or, you know, very thick um, gauge needles. But most often, Chinese... Uh, medicine with acupuncture we use very thin needles oftentimes it's a diameter of human hair and um it's not really meant to um injure the skin it's actually so thin it it, it basically it's like it it doesn't um pierce the skin it like um just like moves the skin apart it's kind of weird so most of the time it doesn't bleed it doesn't cause a bruise um but occasionally we hit a vein you know it would bleed but but anyway so it's, it's pretty comfortable you know um but yeah, that's, that's <laughs> always me. something I've actually wanted to check out and try. I've never done it. I've never really. Yeah, 
I, 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 don't know, is, uh, I don't know much about acupuncture, but maybe I'll maybe I'll learn yeah. quite a bit more by the Acu- end of the show. Acupuncture, uh, I'll give you some history. Um, the first uh, recorded text for acupuncture was written in um, about 4,500 years ago, so about 2,500 BC. Uh, it's called the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine, and um, and it's. It, I mean, they also they also know that you know when when acupuncture first started because they can they have found actual ancient needles from that time period, right? So Chinese herbal medicine, on the other hand, cannot be realistically dated because the evidence is eaten, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, you know you. You boil the herbs and you eat it, you know, so, you know, that's the evidence. So nobody knows really when it started, you know, being used, Chinese herbs. But so, um, so yeah, it's gone through many transformations, you know, many um, phases. And, uh, and yeah, I studied a, a couple of the Chinese um, physicians that were, like, very famous in China. Um, you know, some of them had really amazing abilities that most people today would consider to be superhuman like um, one guy said that he was able to um, transplant somebody's heart. I'm pretty sure uh, transplant somebody's heart using herbal anesthesia. <laughs> right. This is like probably like in the first first few centuries, right? Wow. And uh, of course, of course, you know th- those kind of texts were eventually you know lost and destroyed, but. But, you know, we, uh, there was excerpts that I remember reading that this Chinese physician. And there's also another image of, uh, of him treating um, this one general's shoulder who had some kind of uh, maybe like torn ro- rotator cuff muscle. And he basically was surgically um, repairing the tendons while the guy was awake. And, and, the, and, the, and the painting showed the guy playing chess while his, his shoulder is being surgically That's repaired. Amazing. Through herbal anesthesia, right? And of course, compare with you know, um, compare with modern types of anesthesia, you know, which which you know they um, have enormous side effects. Which is basically the reason why anesthesiologists have the largest, um, have the biggest, uh, how do you say, uh, malpractice insurance because it's very dangerous to be an anesthesiologist because imagine you're you're in, injecting in very sensitive areas, this, you know, this medication and very frequently they damage nerves and other things by accident and people sue them, right? So that's one of the major reasons why their malpractice is like the highest, even even higher than like heart surgeons or brain surgeons, like, like really, really uh, <laughs> the risky thing. So, so yeah, so imagine how effective an herbal anesthesia would, would be where, you know, it's not um, you know, it doesn't leave a mark. It's not, it doesn't nearly have as many side effects. It's herbal based, you know, it's just, it's just amazing stuff like that. Um, and also interestingly enough, um, you know, there's herbal medicine in pretty much every country, you know, in their heritage, there's herbal medicine, there's herbs in every country in the native tradition, but Chinese, um, Chinese medicine is kind of unique because they're the only country that has really established a, um, a system of you know assessment, diagnosis, treatment, and they classify each herb according to you know the channel it enters, the organ it and the, the organ it affects, the taste, the color, the temperature, the season. They 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 associate with you know different emotions. <laughs> so it can get pretty complex. Um, and uh, and so yeah, China is kind of unique with that. They they developed this system so. And so it makes it kind of easy for somebody to come along and learn it, right? But if you want to learn, let's say, for example, um, the shaman herbal tradition of of the Amazon jungle, it's not as easy to learn. You know, it's not as systematized, right? So so that's one one advantage uh, that Chinese herbal medicine has. And also, interestingly enough, like I learned about 400 um, Chinese herbs and, uh, you know, I had to learn the Latin and the pinyin Chinese name of it, and sometimes they don't even have an English name. Sometimes they have an English name, um, but that's like a, a minority, a very small percentage of what, um, how how many Chinese herbs are actually used in China. Like 
I think it's something in the vicinity, like last time I heard, last thing I heard was like 50,000 Chinese herbs are oh. used. <laughs> and I learned just like 400, right? <laughs> That's a very complex thing. And, you know, some herbs are like completely um, specialized to like, let's say, you know, cardiac patients or kidney problem patients, you know. So, but the herbs, the herbs I, I, I learned are very general. So, yeah. Interesting. So, <laughs> it's a mystery. Yeah, there's some definite, you know, you're talking about acupuncture, you're talking about herbs, and the, there's some definite differences that we can notice right off the bat um, between Eastern medicine and what we know as Western medicine or modern medicine or mm-hmm. um, allopathy. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah. What, what is what is the difference yeah, in, so, um, the, in the theory or the the approach? Western medicine. Oh, go ahead. Again. I, I I was just asking what the difference between the between the theories is yeah, the difference between the approach bit, uh, of 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 Western medicine and and Eastern medicine of what we know as modern medicine and this right. Eastern medicine. Uh-huh. All right. So yeah. I'll just go into the differences. Um, so, so Western medicine has its, uh, sorry, we'll start with Eastern. Eastern medicine has its roots in Taoism, um, which is basically um, um, a belief and philosophy started by Lao Tzu. Uh, have, you, have you heard of Lao Tzu or the Tao Te Ching? He wrote the Tao Te Ching. He's basically among the um, uh, the the major philosophers in China, Lao Tzu and Confucius and um, there was one more. Um, I forget the other one, but I have but, heard yeah, of Lao Tzu from your show, though. That's about oh, from my show. That's okay, about okay. It, from watching your show. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so Lao Tzu, he uh, he was a very fascinating guy. You know, he um, philosopher. You know, I guess you would call him like a a naturalist or something like that. But he would um, he he. There's not much about him because he didn't really write anything in his life except this one book, Tao Te Ching. And the story goes: the, the only reason he wrote it was because he was he was leaving China because he basically was completely um, he gave up on his own people. He's, and I think I think he said, um, "I'm leave the dead to bury the dead," right? So he didn't even want to try to help his own people anymore. So he was leaving, and the story goes: he was he was trying to get out, and the gates of China. There was a uh, um, there was a guard and he's like, you know, he's like, where are you going? He's like, I'm leaving, I'm going to the mountains. And, and the guard's like, well, at least leave us something so we can learn your philosophy. And so he sat down and he wrote the Tao Te Ching. <laughs> and that was the only remnant of his thoughts. And it's a very quick read, like probably like 70 pages. But um, it's kind of, I guess it's kind of written like poet, like poetry. But it's a very fascinating read. And that forms the basis for Chinese medicine. And I think it's very similar to volunteerism. <clears throat> because it has a lot to do with, um, you know, just non-intervention. You know, we have non-intervention in volunteerism. We have non-intervention regarding monetary system, regarding foreign policy, right? Everything is non-intervention, right? Well, this is non-intervention healthcare. <laughs> this is basically, I guess it's basically like what Hi- Hippocrates uh, said when he said do no harm, right? So you basically intervene as little as possible in the uh, in the body, you know, regarding the medicine, and uh, and you basically allow the, allow the body to do its thing, right? So all you're basically doing is supporting the body's own natural uh, mechanisms, or you know, defense mechanisms, or um, maybe strengthening their digestion, strengthening their immune system, you know, strengthening cognitive function, whatever, um, so that the body can heal itself, which is very passive and non-interventionist, right? Um, as opposed to um, Western medicine, which is much more aggressive. You know, you think of, uh, like, when you go to a doctor, um, you know, you, you and you leave with a medication, the medication is not really meant to make you feel stronger, okay? The medication is basically there to um, forcefully deal with whatever problem you have, right? So... You have a cold, it's gonna right, it's gonna attack and kill um the bacteria. And it's not selective, right? Most of the time it kills all bacteria, right? Which is why you need a probiotic, right? So um which is why, yeah. So so that's you know, with medication and, and also the other thing is that um 
um, you know, our bodies are not um, medication deficient. <laughs> so, so basically, to think that you need Zoloft because you have depression is to, to imply that depression is a Zoloft deficiency. Right. <laughs> right? Right? It yeah, doesn't make and sense. It doesn't make sense at all. It, and the whole idea is that, no, Zoloft is not in our bodies at all. That's a completely artificially, synthetically produced, man-made substance, right? And maybe it had um, origins in a, uh, in a plant or a mineral, which they then refined it down into, you know, to mass produce and, and patent it and make it into medication. Um, but all of that initial uh, wholeness that was in the plant was lost completely. And so now you have this very singular, um, focused um, chemical that when you introduce it into the body um, on, on a very potent, you know, little tablet, it just disrupts so many things. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, you see on all medications, you see the insert with all the side effects, right? <laughs> or when you see a, a medication that, you know, a commercial on TV, right? At the end, you have all the side effects. The guy reads down like in uh, <laughs> like five seconds, right? <laughs> very, very fast. So, so, so basically the difference is like, if I were to go to the, the hospital or a doctor's office, there was an allopathic uh, practitioner. Yeah. Um, and I were to say, I, I, you know, I have these really bad headaches. Yeah. And most likely what they would do is give me a drug to take. They would, they would combat right. that most, and they would, they would get into my system and, and not necessarily be good for me, but it would treat the symptom. Whereas I, if I went to a practitioner of Eastern medicine, they might say like, oh, well, you're, 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 you need an alignment uh, in, in, in. You know, mm -hmm. give me a massage. Yeah. My muscles might be Better. tense, or use uh -huh. herbs to maybe because I have a def deficiency in something. Um, so yeah. they're actually looking for a solution. That am I? Am I kind of getting this right? With yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so um, another way to describe it is the, um, the the concept of the root branch uh, theory, which uh, which is basically what volunteers understand now, right? When you like when when you know you look at people. Um, like the Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street, right? Or the Tea Party people, or, uh, you know, people against Monsanto, right? Or people against BP or Shell, okay? These are branch. They're dealing with the branches of right. the problem, right? This is not the root of the problem. <laughs> so, you know, like uh, Henry David Thoreau, he said, for every thousand people hacking at the branches, there's one person hacking at the root, right? right. So, so, so government is basically what enables all of those you know, fascistic, monopolistic institutions to prosper and thrive, and uh, and and the same thing, um, the same thing with allopathic medicine. When you go to a doctor and you have a headache, he's going to treat the branch. And so, what the what is the branch is that your head pain. That's the branch, right? That's the symptom. He just maybe gives you a um, maybe a painkiller, you know, analgesic, whatever. Um, but you go to a you know Eastern med Eastern practitioner. Um, or, or I mean, any other, I guess, alternative practitioner, they ought to sit you down and talk to you about many things in your life, about your diet, about your work style, about your, you know, lifestyle habits, your exercise routine, your, um, you know, <laughs> you know, everything, you know, your, your stress level, you know, your history, medical history, whatever, um, to get to the bottom of why you're getting headaches, right? Because, um, just like Stefan Mani says, you know, you know, if you have a, if you have tooth pain, you can uh, you know you can uh, shoot yourself with morphine or you know snort some cocaine, and you're not going to feel the pain. <laughs> but it doesn't really deal with the problem, right? And when you don't deal with the root of the problem, it will inevitably get worse. You know, always it's what it's what always happens. So so yeah, that's another awesome reason why um, <laughs> you know um, Eastern medicine is very similar to volunteerism because it's a it treats the root. Of the problem, right? You, and so that's that's one reason why my interviews, when I when I have a patient, for my especially for my in, initial interview, it can be like one hour, two hours of just questions, questions, questions about every. I go through every single um, to find out what is uh, really going on. So, so yeah. <laughs> so would, would you say that Eastern medicine across the boards? is a healthier solution? 
Okay, so um, when I have a patient and they come to me for whatever problem, um, I don't, I don't just, uh, you know, throw, you know, acu- throw some herbs at them, you know, and give them acupuncture, massage, or whatever. I make sure I discuss why they're having this problem, right? Especially diet. Diet is a big thing I focus on because that's so many, so many people's problems. You know, you know, I can give them the best quality herbs, the best acupuncture treatment, the best massage, but if they're eating the same <laughs> crappy way. Everything's gonna go back, right? So there's no, um, there's no way you can really get around um, abusing your body, you know, when you're not taking care of yourself nutritionally, right? So, so one one way I heard put very well is um, you should eat eat for the body that you want, not the body that you have. <laughs> okay, so so some people just you know you know just I guess don't care and they just you know maybe most of the time young kids you know they they eat a lot of uh, you know junk food and fast food and you know fried food or spicy food because you know they're young and they don't see their you know they they don't see immediate problems because their bodies are more resilient whereas older people um, you know as you get older your body breaks down it's less resilient and so when you um, abuse your body nutritionally you know it's more quickly and acutely felt right so so that's why primarily nutrition is a very very big thing with me so i have you know big conversations about that and that goes that goes <laughs> in is that part of chinese or part of eastern medicine is oh yeah yeah big it? time yeah nutrition big time oh yeah okay. um there are certain herbs that um okay so so let me just give you a there's a breakdown three ways uh you can classify chinese herbs um the first way is um, they're called tonics or food grade herbs. So these are herbs that you can eat on a daily basis, but they're also considered herbs because they're very um, they have an effect on the organs. And then the second um, the second way is like um, there's like the medium the medium class, and you can use them for a short term until you achieve the desired result, and then you stop using them. And then the third class is the more powerful um, herbs, like you know the harsh cathartics harsh purgatives or, you know, very powerful uh, antimicrobial herbs. And these herbs, although they're, they're like the, the most powerful of, of the herbal classes, they're, they're still not, eat, not nearly as powerful as antibiotics or Western medication. So you can get an idea, right? Because these are still, even though they're, you know, they're powerful herbs, they're still um, just herbs. They're natural substances, right? right. But, um, you know, there's, there's, you'd be it's like, um, there's a nerve called the croton seed, and um, it's this thing. It looks like a cardamom pepper, and it has a few seeds in it. And 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 basically, uh, I remember going to college, and one of my Chinese friends said that in China, um, they would go to the club and they would carry powder of this seed, like as a joke, and they would they would sprinkle a bit of the powder in their friend's drink, and it's a harsh cathartic, right? So it it's not it, it doesn't only release your bowels, but it releases your bladder so everything it drains everything out of your body <laughs> it's very powerful and you just need a small amount too and so they do that as a joke <laughs> but I've, uh, I've, joke. <laughs> I've seen it i've seen it in action now i really have seen i'm not on myself but i've seen it in action one of my friends did it and it's very powerful like you're you're going to the bathroom you know first it cleans out all of your bowels movements and then then it's just water 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 coming out <laughs> <laughs> and, and that kind of powerful herb is basically only meant for extreme cases like people with um, liver problems, ascites, you know, abdominal swelling, where they have extreme water retention right. and you but, just want to purge it. Even though it's a medicine for extreme case, cases, it, it's not going to hurt somebody. It's not going to... Okay, 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 that's another that's another myth, okay? So, um, you know, they say, well, this is natural. I can't get hurt by it, right? Um, well, obviously not, especially with this kind of herb, <laughs> you know, there are natural substances that are, uh, uh, dangerous, you know, it's like, you know, venom, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a cobra's venom is a natural substance, right? <laughs> you know, so, so natural does not necessarily mean safe, right? So, um, this again comes back to the skill of the, uh, the practitioner, right? So if you can accurately assess through, um, you know, through your, um, accurate detail of you know your problem, 
Um, if you can accurately assess your, your, your complaint and give you the correct herbs, then, uh, yeah, there should be no problem. Most of the time, there is no problem. Um, and, and most of the time, you know, we don't really use those very powerful herbs because most of the time, the only setting that's appropriate is like in a hospital, you know, so I don't really treat liver ascites people, <laughs> you know, people with swollen bellies, not, <laughs> you know. Right. The, but would, uh, it, would it be better for those people to go to a, to an Eastern medicine practitioner than to go to the regular allopathic? Okay, doctor? okay. All right, so, um, the only time that I recommend people go to Western doctors or allopathic physicians is for traumatic injuries and emergency care, like hospital, right? You know, you're in a car accident, you're not going to go get acupuncture, right. <laughs> you know? You're, you know, you, bro you broke your leg, you're not going to get, you're not going to get herbs for that, right? <clears throat> so you need to get bone setting and maybe a cast. Um, but um, for but everything is, else... Is bone setting and all those kind of... Is, is there a place in Eastern medicine for traumatic care or... Yeah, there is, there is, um, um, you know, a history in Chinese medicine of, uh, you know, people who are, you know, Chinese practitioners who specialize in emergency care. But of course now with modern technological advances, you know, you, you, a person wouldn't really go to a Chinese physician you know, right after a car accident, you know, so it's just, it's just, um, it would be inappropriate. So, so you would go to the hospital, but for anything else, other than that, if it's a chronic condition or a, a systemic condition, you know, other than emergency care, I would not go to a physician at all, at all, because it just, it just makes you, it, you're going to come out worse than when you went in. Because again, medications do not increase your immune system. They do not increase your energy level. They don't um, increase the, improve the functioning of your, of your digestive system. They don't improve the functioning of your bowels, you know, like they're forceful, right? So you have acid reflux, it's going to suppress the acid production, right? You have high cholesterol, it's going to suppress the cholesterol, all right? It's not dealing with why you have high cholesterol or why you have acid reflux, right? <laughs> so, you know, I would give, like for example, acid reflux, I would give them herbs for acid reflux, there is, you know, there is herbs specifically for acid reflux, but of course that's combined with dietary recommendations, you know, so if the person's eating, you know, you know, they love uh, spicy food and fried food and they have acid reflux, of course, you know, I'm going to give them herbs to help them feel comfortable now, but of course I'm going to tell them, you know what, if you don't stop eating this, you're not going to get better you're, and you're probably going to get an ulcer eventually. It's going to burn right through your stomach, right? So... <clears throat> So yeah, I don't really recommend because also another thing is physicians aren't really trained in um, in nutrition, not at all. I think they get like in their like eight or nine years of schooling, they get like one course in nutrition. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous, but um, but again, the, you know the thing the the, the knowledge that I know about nutrition, I'm more gained outside of college um, through my own research and reading. I do I did so much reading afterwards. So to, um, you know, to teach myself about nutrition, because that's such a, that's such a vital topic for people to understand, you know, and so many people, you know, it's like after it gets past your mouth, they're like, they're like, you know, this food's not going to affect me. <laughs> you know, you forget, it's so easy to forget about the things that you eat and, uh, and the effect that it might have and the relationship it has on the diseases that you have, right? The complaints. So, so yeah. So, you have any other? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, I got. I know we're actually we're getting pretty close to our thirty minutes here, but you know, if you don't mind keeping yeah. keeping the conversation yeah, no, going, then I would love to. Sure, uh, I'm fine. You, know, you have any other questions? Any other yeah, specific yeah. questions? Eastern medicine, uh, it seems to have a much wider variety of methods mm -hmm. than the surgery or drugs approach yeah. that we're we're used to from modern allopathic medicine. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about acupuncture a little bit. We've talked about herbs. What are some of the other forms of Eastern medicine that? Okay, so so that's um yeah. So basically, it's like um, acupuncture, herbs, massage. Um, also, um, you know, not really now, but more in the in the ancient uh, 
um, inclusion of, uh, of Chinese medicine used to be qigong or medical exercise, medical, uh, they say, um, medically related exercise, um, or tai chi also. Um, and then, and then there's, there's various different types of treatments under acupuncture, like there's gua sha. Uh, if you, if you heard gua sha, it's a, it's a, it's like a scraping of the skin. There's like special gua sha tools. Uh, one of them you, is made out of water buffalo horn. The other one's uh, made out of jade. And it's basically, it's basically for tight muscles, spastic muscles, and scraping the skin. And um, and it just basically helps to relax the muscle and releases uh, tension. And then there's cupping. I'm sure you've heard does, of cupping, does right? The skin scraping does that do anything for the skin? The exo does it? Okay, so uh, well, 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 let me say, um, have you heard of cupping? No, I okay. Okay, so cupping is actually that cupping is actually pretty common in um, in the West with celebrities. Um, if you look up, I think it's Gwyneth Paltrow. She went to some like um, um, award ceremony, like the Oscars or something, with an open back dress, and she had cupping marks. Like she just went to an acupuncturist, but okay. she wasn't afraid to. I actually I have heard of that. Now that you, yeah, now that you yeah. say that, I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you know, concentric circles, um, and basically, you know, it's most of the time they use glass cups. Um, usually we use fire. Sometimes they can just use suction, you know, um, without fire. But I like using the fire because um, it has a nice warming component to it. So eventually it feels nice on the skin. And so the same same idea as the gua sha. Um, you do it where there's muscle tension and spasm or and pain. And um, and it basically sucks, you know, you cause a vacuum, sucks up the, the skin and the muscles. And um, it basically breaks the small capillaries so that circulation can freely flow um, into and out of the muscle, right? Because the spastic muscle is a muscle that has very poor circulation, right? Into or out, right? So there's like basically, um, there's basically like blood that's stuck in the muscle, right? So when you break those small capillaries, it releases and it leaves and then fresh blood comes in. And so, and that's what the healing is, right? The fresh blood. So, um, so that's that's the cupping, and then the gouache is basically you're doing the same thing, except you know you're scraping the skin, and uh, you know you put some oil on the skin because you're not doing it for the skin, you're doing it for the muscle under the skin, right? So eventually you're going to see these marks, and you can just uh, you can ch check on YouTube gouache G U A S H A, and you'll see a bunch of videos on it. Um, and uh, I do it on you know I do it on my uh, myself and my my brother, you know, my wife, I do that everybody, <laughs> you know, the, the cupping is nice, but you gotta like get set up and, and, you know, you gotta, you gotta have my alcohol, you know, use isopropyl alcohol. You got my, my, my cotton swabs and I got to light on fire. So it's a big process, right? So, but the gouache, the gouache is very quick. So those are both things that are, that are good to do just on a regular basis. Just if you have, oh, yeah. if you have back pain for whatever reason, they're just good to do on a regular basis. If say you're, yeah, sure construction maker or something like that you... oh definitely you know like um like let's say a massage therapist i'm you know as a massage therapist my forearms would be very tight right so that's something i, would, I was doing a lot when i was doing more massage um but let's say construction work you probably have very tight erectus spinae muscles in your back or your shoulders probably right so you know i can i can i can figure that out pretty quick <laughs> yeah that's, that's kind of one thing with me is Wherever I am, I'm massaging people. <laughs> That's just my thing. I just feel comfortable when I'm massaging people. <laughs> and I know, like, I go straight to where the person, I can I can pretty much tell where they have tension immediately. And they're like, how did you know that that's there? <laughs> but, um, yeah, and, and, and if you're doing gua sha, you just focus on that area. Oh, oh, and by the way, if you wanted to do gua sha on yourself or on somebody else, um, you know, I don't use that instrument you know made out of you know water buffalo or energy i use a spoon <laughs> just like a spoon yeah just basically all you need is something with a um a blunt end to it you know it's not not like a razor you know you don't need something sharp but a blunt end right so so just something to scrape scrape the skin and um and you know and i alternate with massage because you know scraping the skin can be pretty uncomfortable after a while so i'm always alternating with massage but but yeah, basically the idea is just to go deep and slow, deep and slow. You know, if you, if you go too shallow, you're just basically tickling the person. <laughs> so deep and slow because the focus is on the muscle layer, right? Not on the skin layer. 
So, so you feel where they have muscle tension and pain. You, you, you know, you locate that spastic muscle and then you just attack it basically. And you're going to see first it's going to get red, which is called hyperemia, it's just redness. But, and that's, but that's not the, uh, that's not uh, the end of it. You're not done. You have to continue. And if it's a really spastic muscle, it's going to release the, the, the stagnant blood is going to release and you're going to see it's going to start turning dark red, sometimes even purplish. And, and that's good. You know, that's, that means it's, it's relaxed it's released. And, um, and that old blood, depending on how young the person is, um, it could stay maybe like a few days or if they have very bad circulation, maybe a week. Right. So, um, so yeah, so I do it to people's necks. Neck is an excellent way. Everybody has so much neck tension, right? And so I, that's a great place to do it. I did. I do it on everybody. My sister-in-law, my my wife, my brother. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. That's man. I, I could keep talking talking to you about that and learning about that. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually. I'm probably gonna try that out on myself later. Watch some YouTube videos or something. Yeah. T- but, check uh, it out. I uh, I, I can. Uh, Hey, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of them. Um, I guess I'll try to send you one that, that I think is a good one. Oh, that'd be but great. It's I'll, hard and to I'll post it in the in the in the comment section. Uh, okay. So everybody can it, see it. It's hard to it, it's hard to um, explain. Like, I really have to show you. You know, demonstrate. It's hard to say. Like, you have to go this deep. You know, so it's like you know how they say. Like, um, you know, you you explain something, and I, you know, I'll understand it a little, but then just show me, and then I. I got it, you know. <laughs> so, firsthand, um, you know, um, just learning. You know, learning by doing, right? That's the uh, that's the best way to do it to learn, right? So, so yeah. Any other? So yeah, I wanted to I wanted to get into the actual because the topic of our show today is is fascism and how to combat oh, fascism. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we got talking about all the interesting things about Eastern <laughs> medicine. I hope. We haven't left our viewers a little too lost, but yeah. how is modern day allopathic medicine a special interest group in our current corporate fascistic government? How does that work? All right. All right. So, um, so basically, as as our government has grown, right, it has um, it has um, created so many of these um, government entities, and one of them is the FDA, right? Food and Drug Administration. And and so this regulates, you know, food and medication, right? And so basically it regulates medicine, right? So uh so so then you know so so th- with acupuncture, the acupuncture license only um came about like in the nineteen seventies. That's when acupuncture really got big. I think when President Nixon went to uh went to China and he uh he learned more about it and he saw somebody, he actually saw somebody get an appendectomy, I believe, uh, without any kind of um, anesthesia, just acupuncture. Yeah, that's nothing. You can have acupuncture anesthesia. It's kind of interesting for surgery, so right? You, for an you appendectomy. Hit, you hit a certain nerve or something and it shuts yeah, down? The- yeah. It could, be, it could be ear acupuncture. That's one way to do it because there's so many sensitive points on the ear. It's about um, 88 sensitive points on the ear. And uh, it's basically the same thing as uh, reflexology for the foot. Uh, you know, the foot has the whole body mapped out, right? So the same thing with the ear. Here, the, the body has the whole body uh, mapped out on the ear. So it's an inverted fetus, right? So the, the head would be on the on the lobe, and uh, and then you have the neck, back, and then the feet up here. So so yeah, so so ear is most likely how they did it. And and then um, the uh, and then it came back here, became more popular, and then you know, of course, the government has it get dirty little hands in it too. So they, they may have a license, acupuncture license to try to regulate it. <clears throat> and, uh, and yes, that's how that started. And then with, with allopathic medicine, um, in the early 20th century, like maybe like 1910 around there, um, you know, there was no license for physicians at all. Um, and they were basically, um, in competing with, I believe homeopathy at the time. And so there was a big like uh, battle between them and everything, and then and then somehow eventually the physicians they they started um, I forget it was the name of some organization that eventually um, aligned itself with government, and then they took control of the medical field 
by um, you know by starting the the license for physicians, right? So now that that you know completely shut so many people off from even practicing medicine, right? Because not practicing without a license becomes a uh, a felony. And uh, and so yeah, so eventually it just basically grew from there and became a special interest group. And and uh, you know now today you have the big pharmaceutical industrial complex, these enormous big um, pharmaceutical corporations that are basically monopolies on um, uh, pharmaceuticals, right? Because they uh, by the FDA. Yeah, yeah. Basically, so so, so the uh, the um, the whole revolving door thing applies here as well, like the. You know, CEOs of various pharmaceutical companies, they, um, you know, enter into the, the top positions of the FDA, of government, or, or of the regulatory agencies that are meant to regulate those pharmaceutical companies, right? So, again, it's like the fox guarding the hen house, right? <laughs> so, That's so uh, do, you know, do you know who Kevin, Kevin Trudeau is? Have you heard of Kevin yeah. Trudeau? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I read, I read his first book. Yeah, I, I read the book yeah. too. I, I don't remember the title right now, but I, I just thought of that. I actually haven't been thinking about that this whole time uh-huh. I've been talking. But yeah, is that uh, is that something you would recommend, knowing you have more of a background? Uh huh. Uh oh, you mean to recommend to read? Yeah, that book. <clears throat> um, I mean, it was a while ago that I read that. Um. So there are probably other things I'd recommend, but um, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, as far as I know, he was pretty good. Uh, I did, I did hear that there was a recent scandal with him that where he got arrested, right? Did you hear about that? No, no, I just yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard that recently. Like he was in the news, um, I don't know, maybe like a year ago or less, where he got arrested because one of his claims, you know, was false, and they they said he was like uh, giving um, false medical advice, something like that. Mm. Which is, uh, you know, kind of ridiculous because he's just, he just help, trying to help people, you know. <laughs> he just wrote a book, you know, trying to help people. And he gets, uh, he gets vilified. So, but, um, but yeah, so, so you have this enormous pharmaceutical industrial complex that has grown to gigantic proportions, right? And, and then, you know, you have this, this, these, um, so these pharmaceutical companies that they, they mass produce these medications, and then and then on top of that, they they say they they studied it, you know, they 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 put it through like double blind, you know, rigorous uh, placebo control studies, um, which again is kind of uh, um, kind of Im- uh, impossible to believe because they're the ones that funded their own studies, right? So how can you how can you entrust a corporation to regulate itself basically what it's doing right it, it it's studying itself <laughs> which is the same thing like with government like you know when the police does something wrong and they're like don't worry we're going to investigate ourselves <laughs> and then we find ourselves to be innocent <laughs> so in the same way is uh these pharmaceutical companies they they conduct these uh these studies and and they can basically publish to the fda whichever study they want. So they can basically do like, let's say they do 30 studies and 28 studies conclude that this medication is fatal. You know, it kills people. And two studies say that it has slight benefits. <laughs> of course, they're only going to give those two studies to the FDA. And the FDA is, all right, good. You know, stamp of approval, you know, it goes into the general circulation and then, um, and then, it, you know, kills a few people and they just repeal it. And it's just like, it, it's just amazing because people still continue to put their trust in these very dangerous and powerful medications, um, even though they have such a history of like, you know, a fatal history of killing people, you know, and these are all FDA approved medications. It's not like they like slipped through <laughs> by accident, you know, they're actually approved. And and then they turn around every time somebody like, uh, has, you know, let's say a little side effect of like vitamin C, you know, you see it all over the newspaper, overdose vitamin C. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know? uh, on the on the converse side of that, is there anything that in Eastern medicine that is not approved by the FDA or that is illegal that the federal, federal government bans or? Well, um, so, so acupuncture is a kind of regulated, right? Because there's a license, but herbal medicine, not really. Herbal medicine is not regulated at all, basically. So I have a certificate. I'm a certified Chinese herbalist. So that's not a, a license like granted by government, right? 
it's like I guess I guess it's like a local certificate. Um, and and the other um, the other proof of that is that you can go to Chinatown and you can buy herbs yourself. You just go into some Chinese store; they're selling they're selling the same herbs that I'm prescribing, um, and you can just buy them in bulk if you want. You know, so anybody can buy them basically. <laughs> you know, um, and and actually that's a good thing. <laughs> you know that it's not regulated because I imagine if it was regulated, um, you know, it, it would be it would be tragic. You know, you know the supply would go down. You know, people w- wouldn't be able to access it as much. It would just be. Um, it's just, it's just horrible. Like, uh, you know, it's like, it, it's like, if, if you really think that your profession or whatever you do, or if you're good at it, why are you afraid of competition? Right? Why do you have to try to make a license to shut other people out? Right? Because <laughs> that's essentially what a license is, right? It grants um, authority to certain groups of people that can, let's say, afford to go to college um, or, or study all this stuff, and and other people who want to do the same thing without studying, you know, they're criminals. Like, you know, a shaman who wants to practice, you know, um, herbal medicine or or let's say acupuncture, he's a criminal because he doesn't have a license. It's okay. completely ridiculous. Okay, so it would be e- Eastern practice. Practitioners of Eastern medicine have to be licensed across the boards, no matter what they're doing, or is it just certain types of medical treatment that have to be licensed for? Well, just 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 the um, acupuncture is licensed. So okay. acupuncture and for me massage. So I have a massage therapy license and you an can, acupuncture license. You can be a doctor yeah. and you can prescribe. Okay, you need to take this herb this mm-hmm. amount of times a day, and that that's fine. The government doesn't mess with that. Yeah, yeah, they don't. Okay. Not yet, anyway. Don't give them any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Um, but, but let me tell you something else. Uh, fascinating. Another fascinating thing I, I learned about allopathic medicine is I, I delve I delve deeply into the cancer industry, and and uh, you know the relationship of that with government, and that is that is an amazing history to learn because um, cancer. Is really t- today a major, a major, major um, profitable industry, the cancer industry, right? So basically, once you're diagnosed with cancer, you you're worth um, on average about three hundred thousand dollars by the time you're dead, right? And that's basically like just a general average, right? You know, including all the chemotherapy, all the radiation, all you know, including the surgery costs, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the FDA has so, um, um, controlled the cancer industry that they, they say, according to the, according to the FDA, the only approved, um, treatments for cancer are three things, um, chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. That's it. That's the only approved FDA approved, um, methods for treatment Anything else, if you do anything other than those three things and then you say you you treat cancer, you know, you're going to get your license revoked, you're going to get fined, and you're most likely going to get imprisoned. So so that's why a lot of people who do treat cancer quite successfully are not in this country. <laughs> you know? Okay, so, so a, there um, are those restrictions. Like if if there are, there are herbs, say, that help mm-hmm. to treat cancer, you can't. Yeah. As a doctor in the United States, you can't say you can't prescribe those herbs to treat cancer. Yeah, no, 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 you can't. I mean, I mean, I mean, you can give it to people, but you can't like advertise I treat cancer. You know, okay. like you know, on your on your on your business card or you know wherever you advertise, because if somebody catches that and they report you. Then that's about you know, there, there's so many there's so many um, alternative methods for treating cancer that have been destroyed by the FDA and censored and blacklisted and, you know, the people mysteriously die in an accident and their lab gets destroyed, you know, and it's just amazing how many, um, you know, how much, um, um, you know, covert, really uh, disgusting tactics are used to silence these people. You know, it's it's very sad how much force they use. But, um, 
And I don't, I don't know if you know, but there's, there's a bunch of, you know, uh, alternative cancer therapies, one called the Gerson therapy. There's one called, uh, this guy treats cancer as a fungus and he uses, I think primarily, um, baking soda, <laughs> something, I think something like that, sodium bicarb- bicarbonate. Um, there's a bunch of, a, a bunch of them are just basically herbal mixtures, herbal medicines, right? That treat cancer in various ways. The Gerson therapy does it through, um, raw organic, uh, uh, fruit and vegetable juicing. But very potent juices and and then also you know diet you know they talk a lot about diet and uh, and then they do some coffee enemas so big big on colon cleansing and detox with, with coffee so coffee enema yeah what's the, yeah, what's yeah, the significance coffee. of the coffee um, I think the coffee basically just helps to draw out toxins huh. it's just it's just yeah it's just something that that's very uh, effective in that way. Um, and and basically, one of my teachers I remember in in, in college, he he described cancer as um, it, it's not it's not something that just you know you wake up and you have cancer you know like it came out of nowhere because it's he says cancer is like you're driving in your car and the engine light goes on and so um, in in response to that you break the engine light and you continue driving. <laughs> so basically what we were said before you're treating the branch and not the root right you're not addressing the root cause right or you're just ignoring you're just ignoring the signs the signs and symptoms were there all along but you just ignored them and only when it got really bad you couldn't you know the tumor was there it's huge and you know, it's all over your body you can't avoid it anymore then you go to the doctor and you're like help me doctor you know like, like i got this stuff but but whose fault is that? You know, it's like, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, so basically what it is, it's after a long, uh, life of abuse most of the time. And, uh, you know, and, and people expecting to get, um, miraculous cures after abusing their body for decades. It's, uh, it's a little bit drastic, you know? So, um, so, so, so this Gerson therapy is a really amazing. I, I've read up a lot on it. There's a lot of documentaries you can watch on the Gerson therapy, and they have a clinic in Mexico. What is that? G E R S E N. G E R S O N. S O N. Gerson. Yeah, Gerson. Gerson therapy started by this guy, uh, German physician Max Gerson in the 1940s. He uh, he came here from Germany. Uh, I think he's fleeing from Hitler, and um, and he basically stumbled upon this this um mixture of uh, fruit and vegetable juicing and he treated successfully treated himself with migraines for migraines and then he successfully treated this woman for uh tuberculosis and he got famous for that and then he successfully treated his daughter uh who was 13 at the time for bone tuberculosis which was at that time fatal like pretty much 100 percent of the time so today, his daughter is the oldest living survivor of bone tuberculosis. She's continuing his work. She's like 94 years old wow. today. <laughs> so it's really amazing. So, so they have a clinic in Mexico. And basically, the people that go to them are the people that have been told by their doctors, um, you know, there's nothing more we can do for you. We did everything. Get your affairs in order. You're going to die. That's it. That's it. We tried everything, you know? And so, you know, people, they're desperate. They, they'll they try anything, right? So then that's when people try other methods other than the conventional uh, Western medicine model or the or the on- oncology model. So they go to, uh, they try Gerson therapy. And, and so th- they get the ultimate terminal cases, the worst cases you can imagine. And they have an awesome success rate, really excellent success rate. Um <laughs> It's it's just it's just fascinating how it's so non invasive, it's so gentle, but at the same time it's very powerful. And once you give the body um the tools necessary to rebuild, it responds well, you know, pretty well. The the body is amazing, you know, you just you know, there's not much that, that the physician needs to do once the body is given the correct environment to heal, it will just heal. Right. You know, and it's not just one, it's not just one disease that heals. If you're given the correct environment, all diseases heal. You know, you, it's like somebody has asthma, somebody has acid reflux, somebody has constipation, somebody has cancer. 
you know, a person with all these diseases, most likely they're all related. And if you were to help the person in just the right way, they should all improve, not just one. <laughs> right? Because it's not the natural, right. healthy, functioning state of the body and the, the systems of the body. Yeah. Someone yeah, I mean, people are, we're bred to believe that there's a, you know, you, you need a medication for constipation, you need a medication for acid reflux, a medication for, you know, <laughs> you know, headaches. Each thing has a medication, right? And and then there's, you have the side effects of those medications, which need even more medication, right? right so you got this, right, ca right. this, ca this cascade the effect. This cycle of meds. Yeah, so it never ends. And, uh, and, and you, you just, you know, you shouldn't even start that. You know, once you start it, it's so, so hard to get off of them because, you know, once they give you that first medication, let's say for high blood pressure or high cholesterol, that's for life. You know, they, that's, they, they don't want you to stop. And here's the other thing talking about fascism and, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industrial complex is, you know, you have the lobbyists for these pharmaceutical companies who go to these, um, go to these doctors and advertise their medications, They're like this is a new medication that came out, you know, here's samples, give it out, you know, if you use it, and and, you, and, you, and they're so, they're so good, they're so persuasive, they come like, you know, bearing gifts all the time, you know, getting, giving nice flowers or nice, you know, quality food, or the, sometimes they even like take these doctors out like on uh, nice vacations with their families or they buy them yachts or something like that, you know, all this to kind of, um, smooth up to them so that they, they will use their medication and give it out to as many people as possible. That's basically their incentive is to, is, you know, if you go to the doctor, most of the time you're going to get a medication when you leave. That's just their incentive, you know. As we know from Austrian economics, people respond to incentives, right? <laughs> Man, there's so much more that we could talk about with this topic. We could go in and talking about the drug war. We could go in and talk yeah, about yeah. so many things. Exactly. But unfortunately, we're we're running out of time. We're running at 58 no minutes problem. right now. No problem. Uh, we, got a, we got a few more minutes of extra time for that little edit I got to do in the middle. But no that's, that's about it. Thank you so much for coming and talking to me about all this stuff today. And hopefully... Uh, I can have you on again sometime soon because you're just such a cool, interesting guy, and we, we could t we have so much to talk about. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much for having um, me. This it's again, awesome. this is Daniel Cuellar. He's my uh, my guest today. His show is the Peaceful Anarchist, and he has a blog by the same title. Um, he is on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Um, is there any? Um, resources any books any websites that i should know about that the viewers should know about that i could link to in the descriptions section um to learn more about um i've read so many books it's yeah say. sorry to put you on the spot there. I, I, I would say i would say you know you know get familiar with uh the gerson therapy there's a lot of awesome documentaries on that you can link to um there's um you know, just experience different alternative medicines. There's there's so many, you know, naturopathic medicine, chiropractic is kind of considered alternative medicine, acupuncture, homeopathy, um, you know, then you have, uh, you know, acupuncture, Chinese herbs, and you have, even have Ayurvedic medicine, which is the Indian um, ancient uh, medicine. You also have shamanism. I'm not really that familiar with shamanism, but that more uh, focuses on the uh, the spiritual and, and uh, you know, it's like a, a journey inside um you know that, that focuses on that kind of thing um there's a book there's a book that i uh, i i basically it's kind of my my bible for uh alternative medicine it's called the alternative medicine guide uh, by the burton goldberg group uh it's a big big fat um gold book and i uh, i refer to that a lot when um when i was young learning about this all these different kinds of me uh, alternative therapies um, and also another great one um, is called Healing with Whole Foods. Um, Paul Pitchford, Healing with Whole Foods. Uh, Paul, P-I-T-C-H-F-O-R-D. Paul Pitchford. That's a great. That's a great one on uh, Chinese um, nutrition, Eastern nutrition, and basically how you can you know keep yourself healthy with good nutrition, basically. So. All right. So great. some excellent. When can we expect uh, your book to come out? Say again? And when can we expect your book to come out? 
<laughs> my book. <laughs> I mean, I've done I've done a lot of writing, but but not like uh, in book form. I guess if I compile it all together, it would be like a small book. But um, just kidding. Yeah. Just kidding. But, but seriously, <laughs> seriously though, Daniel is a very excellent writer. He has check out his blog. Check out Liberty Me. He blogs for Voluntary Virtues Network on Liberty Me, and he has this blog. Is it the Peaceful Anarchist? Is it Blogspot.com? Um, peaceful anarchism peaceful anarchism dot com yeah anarchism dot com I'm sorry I, yeah <laughs> no problem no problem peaceful anarchism dot com same thing with the uh, YouTube channel peace for anarchism and uh, yeah and voluntary virtue network same name so keep it consistent great, great. <laughs> all right well thanks again for talking with me today it's been great and I look forward to talking with you again soon.